Okay. All right, there you go. Thank you very much. So we want to crown today's session in a territorial land acknowledgement. Uh, land acknowledgements might be new to some of you, so I want to clarify what they are. Land acknowledgements bring awareness to Canada's colonial history and, to, uh, and they acknowledge the Indigenous communities who are still active on this land. Um, land acknowledgements also work towards reconciliation between institutions, individuals, and, individuals in, and Indigenous communities. McGill University is located on land which has long served as the site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anish, Anish, Anish and Abeg nations. Pardon me. We acknowledge and thank the diverse Indigenous peoples whose presence marks the territory in which peoples of the world now gather. So, uh, this is the Intro to Grad Studies webinar. If that's what you're here for, that's fantastic. Uh, my name is Christopher Stevens. I'm the Student Life Associate at the Office of Campus Life and Engagement, which is part of Student Services at McGill. Uh, I wear a few different hats, uh, but the one that's most relevant to today's presentation is that I run uh, McGill's university-wide graduate orientation programs. Uh, my role is to ensure that graduate students have the information and support that they need to enjoy a smooth transition into life at McGill. Uh, that includes things like putting together these graduate webinars, as well as in-person events, um, such as the upcoming winter orientation, uh, which I'll talk about towards the end of this session. Each year, I help thousands of graduate students navigate the vast institution, this vast in institution. I am also uh, a former graduate student of McGill as well. Uh, so feel free to reach out to me at any point if you have questions. Uh, joining me today is a number, another member of uh, Clay's team, Annie Campbell. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? I was on mute. Yes. Oh. So hello. <laughs> We're so happy to welcome you today and welcome you kind of start your 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 pre arrival journey to McGill University coming in January. So as I said, my name is Annie. I'm the new student um, experience uh, associate director here at Campus Life and Engagement, and I'm happy to be here to support with the presentation today. So I will be managing the chat. So if you do have any questions that pop up as we're presenting, as Chris is doing the presentation, I'll be here to receive them and we can uh, help integrate them into the presentation at certain points as well. So don't hesitate to ask your questions in the chat if you have them. Thank you, Annie. Okay. So uh, what is campus life and engagement? Well, um, we're the ones bringing together this, uh, bringing you this, this webinar today. Um, we normally go by the acronym uh, for our office, which is pronounced CLAY. Um, CLAY is a proud member of McGill Student Services. We are the office dedicated to helping every new student transition into life at McGill. Um, we are also the ones who organize university-wide orientations for both graduate and undergraduate students. And we are here to connect you to the information resources and services that will help you succeed at McGill. Uh, we do focus as well on promoting and encouraging meaningful co-curricular activities, basically everything that will supplement your academic pursuits. At any point during your first year or any year beyond that, you can always reach out to us when I, with any questions you have, and we either know the answer or we know who to put you in contact with. Uh, our goal today is to introduce you to some of the important dates and information, uh, as well as um, as well as topics that are especially important to new graduate students. You might not need some of the resources and services I highlight today, but it is extremely important that you are aware of them uh, in case you do need them at any point. McGill is a very large institution and there is so much on offer here that navigating the ecosystem of offices, services, and resources can be a little overwhelming for new students. So what we're doing here today is essentially planting the seeds uh, so that if you do need something while you're here at any point, you'll be you'll have a better idea of what is on offer and how to get it. Um, so let's start with academics. Uh, you see here a photo of the Islamic Studies Library. This is probably the most beautiful space on campus. I do suggest that everyone take a chance to go and visit it. Uh, it's also, it's, it's a wonderful place to study. Uh, it's just, it is beautiful. Uh, course load and degree time. So depending on your degree level and your program, your expected course load will vary. Uh, but I can give you some general uh, a baseline. 
So we'll start with master's programs. A master's students in general can expect to take four to five courses per semester. At three courses per at three credits per course, you can expect to graduate in about two years. Uh, keep in mind that this is uh, an average. It is not uh, necessarily your specific requirements. Um, the requirements will vary uh, by faculty and by program and sometimes greatly. I saw we have a lot of engineering students here today and engineering students are notorious for having a much heavier course load. Um, so uh, definitely refer to your program's website or reach out to your program uh, if you have any questions about your specific course load. You do have a degree time limit. Uh, it is three years for full-time studies in a master's program or five years part-time. Uh, but I will note that international students must be enrolled in full-time studies. For doctoral programs or PhD programs, uh, the course load is extremely program specific. I cannot provide any real uh, information in that regard uh, beyond the fact that it is normal for uh, doctoral programs to uh, have you take courses in the first year or two uh, before really transitioning into your research or your uh, thesis writing proper. There is a degree time limit for uh, doctoral programs at McGill that is seven years or six years if you're coming directly from uh, a master's program. Next up, we have your username and email. Uh, your username and your email is, or your email address are the same. Uh, it's generally first name dot last name at McGill, at mail.mcgill.ca. Uh, if you have a really common first and last name combination, you might have a number at the end of it. Um, you will be using this username to access all of McGill's platform services, any apps you have access to uh, because you are a student. So this is the virtual private network. This is on campus Wi-Fi. Uh, this is the campus printing service or the scanners. Um, all the various apps such as Zoom, uh, Office 365, MS Teams, uh, as well as Minerva and My Courses, which are two major platforms I'll talk about in a moment. You can access your email through Outlook, uh, both the browser and the desktop app, um, but you can also have it set up on your uh, iPhone, on an Android device, uh, or on Linux. I have a link here at the bottom of the page that will take you to the IT services knowledge base that walks out, walks through the instructions on every single platform where you can uh, set up your mail client. So there are two major platforms that every McGill student is going to be using. The first is Minerva, which you might have already uh, explored a little bit. Minerva is a platform through which you can access your student records, register for courses, review or update your financial info or your personal info. info. Uh, and in a few years or six years for some of you, uh, that's also where you can apply for graduation. Uh, this is also a platform where you will find the academic integrity tool, uh, tutorial rather, which is a mandatory tutorial I will talk about on the next slide. Uh, you also want to become familiar with my courses. This is McGill's virtual learning environment. Uh, it hosts the online component of every single class at McGill. And it's there that you'll find your course syllabi, uh, your course readings, it's where you'll submit assignments or take tests, uh, and so forth. You can also find like announcements from your prof on it uh, and a discussion board where you can interact with your classmates. Uh, and if you have any group work, there's generally space there for group work. Uh, my courses also host uh, three tutorials that um, you wanna be familiar with, uh, the GLOW or Grad Life Orientation modules, uh, the supervision tutorial, and it takes all of us. And I'm gonna talk about these now. Uh, Grad Life Orientation or GLOW, this is on my courses. Uh, this is an online orientation module for graduate students. It uh, explores a lot of important topics for graduate students and provides more explanation than say this webinar does. Uh, it can go a bit deeper uh, and a bit more broad as well. It's filled with videos, um, which uh, some of our current graduate students sort of explain the different aspects of graduate life. Um, they're really nice. Uh, some wonderful student actors in there. Um, you'll find information on things like finance and funding or housing, uh, advice on renting um, houses in Montreal or renting apartments in Montreal, um, and information on the graduate community, all sorts of topics like that. Uh, mandatory tutorials. So first up, we have the academic integrity tutorial. 
Um, this is mandatory for all students, grads and undergrads. Uh, it is hosted in Minerva. It is what exactly, exactly what it says on the tin. It's about academic integrity. So it covers topics like uh, plagiarism and stuff. Uh, you go through it and then you essentially agree to abide by these regulations and that's that. You also have, it takes all of us. Uh, this is mandatory for all students as well. Uh, and this is about building a safer campus by raising uh, awareness of sexual violence or interpersonal power dynamics uh, and those sorts of things. This one is hosted on my courses. It's a bit more interactive um, than the academic uh, integrity tutorial. And it takes about 40 minutes to complete. So uh, not listed here, but for those of you taking supervision, you will also find a GLOW module uh, alongside the grad life orientation just about supervision, which is also mandatory. And it will walk you through some of the policies and regulations and expectations uh, regarding the supervisory relationship. Now, uh, these modules are actually, uh, as I said, all mandatory, but you need to complete them by the end of your first semester at McGill, or a hold will be placed on your ability to register for future classes. Um, so do not forget to do those. Ah, here we go, supervision tutorial. Um, as I said, mandatory for everyone who will be having a supervisor, which is everyone in a doctoral program or in a master's thesis program. Uh, let's see. Next up, course registration. As we talked about a few slides back, you register for your courses through Minerva. You can find the registration tool by navigating to the student menu and then to the registration menu. So that part's pretty easy. Your registration date as new students is December 1st at 9 a.m. Uh, there are a few other important registration dates you should be aware of. Uh, January 4th is the deadline to register for at least one class in order to avoid a late registration fee. And then the period between January 5th and January 17th is the add drop, add drop period where you can still make changes to your course schedule, um, but a late registration fee will apply if you have not already registered for classes. Uh, fall and winter terms. Um, Registration opens for fall and winter terms at the same time, but as you're coming in in the winter term, you're obviously not registering for last fall's classes. Um, but this is something to be aware of uh, when registration opens in the summer for fall and winter again. You'll be planning your schedule for both uh, terms at the same time. Uh, as I said, registration opens on December 1st. Uh, you will have to do something. There's a little quirk of the system. You need to register for what is called a registration confirmation course or R-E-G-N, R-C-G-R. Uh, you have to do this uh, as a new student for the winter semester, and it has a course registration number, which is something you can use to look it up in the registration system of 190. Uh, and as an additional note, you have to register continuously for every single term during your program, uh, excluding summer terms for most students, um, unless you request a, a formal leave of absence. Uh, do you need help with course registration? Well, uh, there are a few places you want to turn to. Uh, first of all, visiting the Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies How to Register uh, webpage. They have uh, pretty compre comprehensive information on the registration process. Uh, they lay out all the dates uh, for registration um, and things like that. Uh, if you're really having difficulties or a web page isn't doing it for you, you want to contact Service Point, uh, where you can speak to a human being and, and they can provide you with uh, more detailed support. Uh, but if you have specific questions about course requirements or what you should be taking rather than I'm having trouble registering in general, then you need to contact your graduate program coordinator. Uh, who is that? Well, uh, there are two people uh, in each department who are very important for how things run and, and positions you want to get to know. Um, first up is your graduate program coordinator or GPC. Uh, these will be one of your main contacts during your studies. Um, they deal with program requirements and regulations. Uh, they're the right person to contact if you have questions about these sorts of things. Uh, you can also consult them with questions about fellowships. Uh, or if you have, um, if you want to find out more about specific courses. Uh, next up, you have your graduate program director or GPD. Uh, this is the person in your department, usually a faculty member or perhaps always a faculty member who manages your program as a whole. You probably won't see them that often, um, definitely not as much as your GPC, but they do play a really important role, especially in mediating issues between students and supervisors, uh, which most of you will have. 
Thank you, May. May just uh, jumped yeah. in. We have a question in the chat that was relevant to course registration. So yeah. a student is, is asking, this may be more an issue for service point, but I think we can direct them to the right, uh, uh, the right resource people. Right. If they register for courses, but then need to defer their program, what happens? Who should they talk to? Uh, reach out to your uh, graduate program coordinator uh, about things like deferrals. Uh, admissions, deferrals, these sorts of things are handled uh, at the graduate level by the specific departments, um, not by service point itself. So send an email to your GPC. Uh, you will find on this slide here, over on the side, find your specific GPC or GPD. Uh, that link will take you to a list of all of them by program at McGill, so you can quickly identify who it is you should be contacting. Uh, graduate regulations. So we aren't going to go through these. Uh, in most cases, they're really just common sense, uh, but it would also take longer than we have time for. And honestly, uh, it would bore all of us to death. Uh, but I do highly suggest that you go through and read them uh, at a later time. Um, you can find uh, important regulations in a few places. The first is the e-calendar. Uh, this is where all, every single course is listed out, as well as um, program specific um, details like course requirements um, are, are laid out. Uh, it also includes graduate policies and regulations um, and, and uh, policies and regulations that all students uh, must abide by. You also have the Office of the Dean of Students. Uh, they oversee student rights and responsibilities, as well as disciplinary procedures. Uh, which is all compiled in the handbook on student rights and responsibilities. I've also included, again, a link here for your graduate program contacts, like your GPC, um, should you ever need to consult them about the policies within your program. On to graduate supervision. Uh, most graduate students will have a supervisor. Uh, this includes all doctoral students, PhD students, and all master's students uh, who are enrolled in a thesis program. So your relationship with your supervisor, if you are one of these students, is going to be one of the most influential parts of your graduate studies. Uh, I expect most of you have already been matched with a supervisor. But when this happens uh, exactly, or the process of it, um, depends on program. So those of you in the sciences, uh, you probably selected a supervisor as part of your application process. By contrast, someone who's doing a PhD in Hispanic studies, they won't actually select a supervisor until their end of their first or even second year. Uh, so it, it does vary widely. If you're unsure of when you will be matched, um, check with your program, check your program's website. There's usually information there or reach out directly to your graduate program uh, coordinator. Supervision, your first meeting. Um, your first meeting with your supervisor is very, very, very important. It's at this meeting where you should be, uh, the both of you should be expressing your expectations that you have for each other. Uh, these expectations are written down in what's called a letter of understanding. Uh, you use this letter to outline things such as the frequency of your supervisory meetings, uh, your feedback expectations of your supervisor, and your supervisor's expectations of your written work, things like this. Um, you can find out more information on the letter of understanding and your supervisor relationship at the supervision website, which is linked here. Um, because this relationship uh, is going to be so important, uh, we do have some tips for you. First, uh, I, I am going to reiterate how important it is that you clearly communicate your expectations. Uh, you also want to go over McGill's uh, supervision policies so you know what McGill itself expects of your relationship with your supervisor. Um, I would suggest, and this is going to sound a little odd perhaps to some of you um, who haven't had a supervisor before, but you do want to learn how to manage your supervisor. No two supervisors are the same, uh, like each of you. Every supervisor is unique. They ha have their own styles of supervision, their own styles of communication, which may or may not be the perfect fit for you. You may have to be uh, proactive in soliciting feedback or other support from them, or perhaps you need to be the one to initiate conversations with them. Uh, what I'm going to say here is, is don't be afraid to do so. Make sure you get what you need from your supervisor. Make sure you're advocating for yourself um, in this relationship. Uh, if you do want to get more detailed supervision advice, uh, there is the grad supervision uh, website linked uh, in the middle there, but there is also going to be a supervision basics webinar, um, which uh, we are putting on in 
conjunction with uh, graduate and postdoctoral studies. Um, you can find it at the same place you signed up for this webinar today. Finally, uh, a note on conflict resolution. Um, I, let's be honest, sometimes conflicts do occur even if you lay out your expectations clearly. Uh, in, such, in such cases, um, best practice is to start by attempting to understand the conflict. Uh, like, is this a, a clash of personalities? Are the two of you coming from, you know, very different academic or social cultures leading to some sort of friction? Um, is it possible that your, your supervisor isn't aware? Um, so you definitely want to reach out and talk to them and, and see what can be done. And then finally, uh, you want to escalate if necessary. And on the right side of this slide here, you can see what's called the hierarchy of help which goes from uh, the bottom, which is where you start in your resolution process. And if you don't have a, a resolution, you move up step by step to your supervisory committee, to your graduate program director, all the way up to the Dean of uh, Graduate Postdoctoral Studies. Next up, we have uh, graduate resources. These are the resources that are gonna be supporting you during your time at McGill. First, we have the Faculty of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies. Uh, commonly referred to by GPS. Uh, they oversee McGill's graduate studies as a whole, and they offer leadership in regard to graduate teaching, supervision, and research for over 400 graduate programs here. Uh, 400 programs is a lot. That's why I can't give you a lot of program specific details. I can just provide generalities in that regard. Uh, 400 different uh, situations is just too much. Um, but this is where you can turn to for specific information about funding, uh, thesis guidelines throughout the whole process. Uh, for supervision, um, they're the people to turn to. They also provide some uh, individual development tools and best practices, uh, notably MyPath, which is a platform and a toolkit for tracking your progress through your degree, as well as um, supplemental sort of co-curricular uh, opportunities along the way that will really help you. Next up, we have teaching learning services uh, and skill sets. Skill sets is really what I want to talk about. Um, skill sets is a suite of graduate specific um, general, transitional, and professional skill development opportunities, workshops, trainings, whatever you want to call them. They're specifically designed for graduate students. These opportunities complement the research you training, you research training you provided by your academic experience itself. And they look into things like teaching or they, they do TA training, uh, leading projects, uh, collaborating and teamwork, time management, but they also have a whole suite of things on business skills uh, and being an entrepreneur uh, as a student. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend you check them out. Uh, we have career planning service commonly referred to as CAPS. CAPS assists students in their career development and their search for permanent part-time summer jobs um, internships as well. Uh, they're really to help you in that aspect of life. They provide uh, workshops, one-on-one uh, -on -one advising, um, complete with uh, specific graduate career advisors. Um, they have a comprehensive job posting uh, service called My Future. Uh, and they also provide things like industry information for both academic and non-academic job markets. And a lot of um, workshops, best practices, advice on the entire process of landing a job from uh, writing out your CV and cover letter to your interview to setting up your LinkedIn profile and so forth. So if you're if you're looking for work or if you want to build sort of that skill set, you want to turn to career planning service. We have Graphos. Graphos is the McGill um, Graduate Writing Center. They exist to teach graduate students and postdocs how to become accomplished scholarly communicators. They offer workshops on a lot of different things, including media specific communications like poster presentations, blog writing, that sort of thing. But they offer a lot of general writing workshops um, and peer writing groups for more traditional um, uh, academic writing. Uh, some of these are one credit courses and some of these courses, uh, especially for doctoral students, um, are free or, or heavily subsidized. Uh, they do have options for non-native English speakers. Um, if you want to improve uh, your communication in English, they are someone to turn to as well. Uh, and some of these are one credit courses. We have student accessibility and achievement. Uh, student accessibility and achievement helps all students achieve their academic goals and overcome barriers. 
Uh, they provide additional specific accommodations for students with documented disabilities, but um, every single student has uh, services or can access services they provide. Um, one such one is tutorial services, uh, which is a network of peer tutors that you can turn to if you ever need extra help, but they have everything from specific access technologies to note taking support, peer support, um, various academic accommodations, learner supports on, uh, they provide a lot of resources or webinars um, on things like uh, improving your study habits, your time management, things like that, setting up a, an effective workspace. Um, it's important to note that like even temporary uh, impairments, injuries, things like that are, are uh, can receive support. So if you break your arm, say, uh, at some point while you're at McGill, um, and it's really hard to take notes or type, they're the ones to turn to and they will provide um, some accommodations for you. International Student Services. Uh, those of you who are coming from outside Canada are probably well aware of International Student Services, uh, but they support the growth, progress and success of international students at McGill. They aim to ease the transition uh, of international students into a new school, a new city and a new country. Uh, they offer a lot of dedicated support uh, but ones I'd really throw out there are the pre-arrival webinars on things like um, immigration, uh, bringing your family uh, to Canada, or uh, accessing healthcare as, as an international student, as well as the International Buddy Program, uh, which is a student mentorship program which will connect you one-on-one -on -one with, um, with an existing McGill student uh, who can help you in your transition. Finally, for, for this section, we have the McGill Library. Um, as you'd expect, you have access to an expansive physical and digital collection through the McGill Library. Um, they also facilitate a lot of services like interlibrary loans. Um, they provide access to a large selection of films and documentaries through Criterion On Demand, Canopy, scanning service. They offer a lot of things. Um, there's a link down there to the McGill Library orientation page. Their services are so expansive, in fact, that they have their own web page and their own handbook. Uh, specifically for orienting and, and helping new students uh, discover what they offer. Um, but what I really, really want you to remember more than anything is that the McGill Library has li liaison librarians. Uh, these are research experts who are focused in uh, or focused on specific disciplines and subjects uh, and who are there specifically to assist students in those fields. Uh, so whatever your area of study is, there is a specific librarian working at McGill whose job it is to help you find the research materials you need. Um, so definitely look up who your liaison librarian is and make use of them. Uh, it will make your life a lot easier. Health and wellness. Uh, you see here, this is a photo of the Brown Student Services Building. Uh, that's where Annie and I are located today. And it's where a lot of the services I've mentioned so far and will mention uh, reside. Uh, as well as um, this is the building where you can access the on-campus healthcare. Um, so let's talk about health. So health insurance, um, your specific health insurance uh, varies depending on whether you are a Canadian student or an international student. Uh, if you are a Canadian student and you're uh, registered full-time, you're automatically enrolled into the Postgraduate Student Society's health and dental plan. Uh, if you need to change your plan, if you want to get off it, or you want to bring a spouse or a dependent onto that plan, you can do so during the change of covered coverage period, uh, which is between December 16th and January 31st. Uh, for international students, it's a bit different. You are automatically and mandatorily <laughs> enrolled into the McGill International Health Insurance Plan, uh, which is overseen by International Student Services. But you may also opt into PGSS dental coverage because that plan doesn't cover dental. Um, I will say there are some exceptions um, for uh, a couple partner countries uh, where students don't need to be part of this plan. Uh, the main one being France. Um, but if you go to that link where it says international students, you can go and look at the exceptions there. Uh, finally, PGSS does provide additional health resources to all students regardless of their citizenship. And so I would check that out. So the Student Wellness Hub, uh, this is the major um, health uh, resource available to you as a graduate student. It is a one-stop location for all your health and wellness needs at McGill. Um, you can make appointments uh, over the phone. 
to consult anyone from a nurse, a doctor, a dietitian, a wellness advisor, um, a psychiatrist, a counselor, so on and so forth, uh, all on campus. Uh, you also have um, a dedicated local wellness advisor named Devin Simpson. Um, local wellness advisors are embedded within specific faculties or in Devin's case, um, available to, to graduate students specifically. And they're there to help you um, access whatever healthcare you need. They can provide you with information, direction, help you, you just help you navigate healthcare in general. They also run a lot of support programming for graduate students. Uh, I think um, I think they're available for one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, for 60, even 90 minutes, uh, depending on, on what's going on, but they are there specifically to support you. So keep them in mind. Uh, and beyond that, you have a huge array of various wellness programs, workshops, self-directed um, uh, resources as well. And there are virtual and telehealth options where you can access um, support remotely. Uh, and there is a link here to the Wellness Hub's guide to accessing off-campus health services. Athletics and recreation. A... Yeah. Sorry about that. Just a couple of questions in the chat. A couple of questions from international students wondering if they can sure. add their spouse to their health care plan uh, with ISS. Um, I will check that out uh, when we get to the end of the webinar because I don't know off the top of my head. I do know it is specifically something you can do with the PGSS plan. In terms of the IHI plan, I'd have to check. I'm sure that information is available though. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, if I forget, remind me uh, when we get to the Q&A and I'll be happy to look it up. Um, at Lives and Recreation, uh, you know, recreational resources uh, and activities are very important to keeping you healthy. Uh, they also, you know, help you meet people, have some fun. Um, there are athletics and recreation facilities at both the downtown and McDonald campuses. I don't know that I spotted anyone here who would be down uh, at Mac campus, but it's possible I missed them. Um, but the facilities include uh, pools, uh, squash and tennis courts, um, basketball courts, track and field, uh, all that sort of stuff. Um, you have access to most of these through your student fees, um, but there are also, um, there's like uh, weight rooms, exercises, cl exercise classes and other things that you can access um, by buying a student membership to those facilities. Um, they also oversee hundreds of intramural activities and teams if you want to just have some fun uh, doing something a little uh, a little less formal. Let's see, Morsel, um, McGill Office of Religious and Spiritual Life, which we often refer to as Morsel. A lot of units at McGill uh, are referred to by their acronyms, which can be a little um, intimidating at the beginning or, or a little confusing, um, which is why I'm trying to give you the full name. Um, so Morsel, uh, well, they provide multi-faith resources uh, and programming uh, for religious and spiritual well-being of students, exactly as it says there. Um, their goals are to provide opportunities for you um, either to practice your own um, faith or, or spiritual, spiritual activities, uh, also connect you with um, your faith community here in Montreal. Uh, and they do a lot of workshops, guest speakers, community events. Uh, they have a very active events uh, listing, which is that final link there. And uh, they provide access to uh, a lot of um, uh, multi-faith and pure faith volunteers. So uh, many students are, are directly covered um, by some sort of uh, faith volunteer who is here on campus. Uh, finally, we have uh, a few additional offices uh, related to health and well-being. Um, there's the Office for Sexual Violence Response Support and Education, which is OSVERSE. Um, they're here to provide confidential and non-judgmental and non-directional non support for those who have been impacted by sexual or gender-based violence uh, for all members of the McGill community. Um, and they're run by uh, the McGill administration itself. As is Students Helping Students, we actually run that at Campus Life and Engagement. Um, yeah, the, the easiest explanation for that is this is a directory of the various peer support and mentorship programs that exist at McGill. So if you're ever looking for some sort of help uh, on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, or if you wanna uh, sign up to offer that help, Students Helping Students is the place to begin. Um, there are also uh, 
plenty of services. Um, I'm just going to list two here, but there are plenty of services offered by uh, student groups themselves, uh, primarily uh, in this context, there's SACOMS, the Sexual Assault Center of McG McGill Student Society, which is very much like Ausverse, but um, provided by students. And you can access both or switch between them uh, at, uh, at will. And uh, Legal Information Clinic at McGill, uh, who provide legal information, not legal advice, um, but also if you need to um, understand more about legal documentation or residency requirements, or if you need to have documents signed by an official um, commissioner of oaths, uh, the Legal Information Clinic is uh, where you can turn to for free help doing so. Oh, it's a bit blurrier than I was hoping. It's an old photo though. Uh, this is McDonald campus. Uh, it is gorgeous. It is much more rural than the downtown campus, which when you arrive, you'll find is very urban. Um, but yeah, it's beautiful. You can see the uh, the Mac campus farm and orchard sort of stretching off into the upper right there. Um, even if you're not studying there, I do suggest you go and visit during the, the summer. Uh, there is a free shuttle that runs between the two campuses that you can take simply by flashing your ID card. It's quite lovely. Um, so funding. There are two types of funding generally at McGill uh, that applies to graduate students. The first is internal funding. This is the funding provided by McGill itself. Um, and it is distributed uh, by McGill as part of your funding package. This can include uh, offers of research assistantships, teaching assistantships, things like that. Uh, these packages are personalized to you and they vary widely from person to person or program to program. Uh, unfortunately, I can't really give you any information on them because I'm not privy to them, uh, nor should I be. Um, but if you do have questions, you can contact your department, contact your graduate program director, they can provide more information on that. Uh, next, there is external funding. So this is funding that is uh, provided by an agency or, or some sort of government body outside of McGill itself. Um, these include grants, awards, fellowships, um, all sorts of things along those lines. They tend to be the big ticket uh, funding opportunities. Uh, there are options for both Canadian and international students. Um, but the big difference between this and the internal funding is that you are responsible for applying for this funding yourself. Uh, that said, most departments or every department has some sort of support they can offer you and also talk to your supervisor and they can give you a lot of advice and support in applying for that funding as well. Uh, for more information, contact your department or check out the GPS funding page. Uh, they compile a lot of information on funding opportunities as well as breakdowns of who can apply for what. Um, I do want to talk a little, about, about, a little bit about the major ones. There are six major sources of external funding that are open to graduate students studying in Quebec. Uh, two each for humanities and social sciences, sciences and technology, and medicine and health sciences. Um, in each case, uh, I, I'm not going to read out their, their names right here. It won't really mean anything right now. But in each case, there is one provincial agency and one federal agency. Um, by and large, the uh, provincial agencies, each of the ones that start with Fond de Recherche du Québec, um, those are uh, generally open in some degree to international students, whereas the uh, federal uh, funding opportunities are more limited. And I do have a link down here uh, specifically for international students where you can visit the international student funding page to get more details on who can apply for what. Outside of funding, there is the McGill Scholarships and Student Aid Office. Um, this is another service in student services here that offers uh, resources and advice to help you pay for your studies, uh, but also to make the most of your budget and make sure you're living within your budget. Uh, so they offer a lot of help with government aid documentation. Um, they facilitate a lot of merit-based or need-based financial support programs uh, and things such as scholarships, bursaries. Uh, they also offer emergency loans. So if, if you are in some sort of financial trouble, they can actually um, provide you emergency funding to get you through that. Uh, they offer specialized funding uh, to help support specific groups or events. Um, you wanna check out that page and see sort of what the requirements are if you have an idea for, for doing some sort of uh, special, special event or that sort of thing. Uh, there are two programs that they oversee, which uh, I do suggest every graduate student check out, uh, almost every graduate student. First up, we have the work study program. 
this is a program that uh, facilitates greater access to on-campus jobs or jobs with McGill affiliated institutions like the, the hospitals uh, in Montreal. Most of them are affiliated with McGill. And the work study program provides greater access to these for students who are receiving the maximum amount of government aid. Um, so it's meant to supplement uh, what you receive from government aid. Um, usually these are, are um, these are clerical jobs. Um, there's jobs in libraries, there's jobs in the hospitals and such. There is some sort of um, meaningful skill building component to them. Finally, we have the Frugal Scholar Program. Uh, this is a program that is, that has been designed um, in collaboration with McGill students. Uh, and it's really focused on things like um, how to budget um, really effectively, or they have the, the cheap sheet, uh, which is a listing of all the cheapest places where you can find food, groceries, clothing, that sort of thing in Montreal. So it, it's, it's a guide to, to uh, really limiting your spending uh, and getting the greatest deals you can while here. Next up, we have the graduate community. Uh, this building right here is Thompson House. This is um, ooh, early 19th century, I believe, uh, limestone mansion. Uh, it is the home of the Postgraduate Student Society and essentially the graduate uh, student clubhouse here at McGill. Uh, this is a space uh, reserved for graduate students. It is the physical hub of the graduate community here at McGill and it is lovely. Um, I will talk a bit more about it inside. Uh, once again, this is Thompson House. So connecting with the community. Um, I, I have to give a little shout out here being that we are campus life engagement. Um, but uh, yeah, it might sound cheesy, but it's really important to, to make connections while you're here at McGill. Um, simply put, a student's involvement in um, campus community events or, or even off campus uh, in the Montreal, wider Montreal community, getting involved outside of your academics in these other sort of pursuits have a lot of tangible practical benefits for you as a graduate student. And they're linked to everything from improved academic achievement to expanded networking career and research opportunities. Uh, if you wanna learn more about the practical benefits of getting involved, uh, uh, research-based uh, practical benefits of getting involved, I do highly recommend you sign up for the Getting Involved as Grads webinar, which is going to be on December 16th. Um, okay, where to start with, with uh, integrating into the community here? Well, uh, we have the Entering Class Facebook group. Uh, this is a private group just for first-year graduate students. As of last night, we have 1,300 of this year's incoming grads in there. Uh, we offer it as a way to sort of help build the McGill community uh, and as a way for you to connect with other students before you arrive. Um, uh, one of the first things that happens is students start reaching out and asking who else is in their program and then setting up WhatsApp groups or, or private chat groups just so they can start talking. Um, so it's a great way to make some new friends, meet people in your program, perhaps future research collaborators or roommates or pet sitters if you've got a pet and you need someone to watch it for a weekend. Uh, this is a great way to start that process. Uh, we also use it, ooh, I have a typo there. We use it to um, announce important upcoming events, especially around orientation, things like that, or projects that are especially useful for new graduate students. Uh, you will not be bombarded with everything that happens in McGill. There's other places to find that info. Uh, so we do curate it and try to make sure it is uh, applicable uh, specifically to newer graduate students. Uh, it's a great place to ask questions. Um, it is monitored by uh, campus life and engagement staff, but also you'll find that other students are perfectly willing to answer your questions. Uh, so those 1300 students who are in there, they've already been here for a full semester, almost a full semester. Uh, they're starting to get to know the university. They can really offer a, a lot of help and advice as well. Um, yeah, and this is the best place right now to connect with other new and incoming graduate students. So I do recommend that you uh, ask to join up. Um, there is a questionnaire when you attempt to join, we will ask for your full legal name as it applies on your McGill admission uh, documents and your program of study. And that's just to verify that you are an actual incoming student. Okay, let's talk about student representation. 
Uh, first up, we have the Postgraduate Student Society, or PGSS. Uh, this is the umbrella organization, the student government organization that represents all graduate students and postdoc fellows at McGill. Um, they run events uh, throughout the year, um, including um, things like uh, ooh, language courses, French language courses, if you want to learn those, or language cafes where you can uh, practice whatever language uh, you like uh, in a casual setting. Um, they have a lot of involvement opportunities at committee levels, especially, but there's also um, reimbursed positions like commissioners and executives and so forth. Um, but their, their main role beside that community building aspect is really representing graduate students here at McGill to the upper administration um, and to the province as well. They are the ones who provide uh, your health insurance uh, and other resources. I do suggest you check them out. Finally, um, they oversee Thompson House. It has been the, their, their home for over 50 years now. And Thompson House is, as I said, the hub, the physical hub of graduate studies, but it also is, um, they have uh, a lot of, uh, it's a good place to hang out. They have a restaurant, they have a fully licensed bar, they have uh, a lot of meeting rooms, which you can book, um, or they have the ballroom. Uh, there's a ballroom in that building, which um, often gets booked by student uh, groups or by small conferences and so forth. Um, just really good place to, to hang out, to relax between classes, to have a meal or a drink after a, you know, after a big test or, or a busy day, that sort of thing. Um, we have the McDonald Campus Graduate Student Society, MCGSS. Uh, this is uh, the organization that represents graduate students at the McDonald Campus. Um, they provide services and resources uh, in addition to those provided by PGSS. So if you are at that campus, uh, anything offered by both groups uh, are, are applicable to you. So you get even more. But they also run a lot of events specifically for graduate students at Mac. Uh, and they do have council positions too, if you wanna get involved in that aspect of student governance. Finally, we have postgraduate student associations or PGSAs. Um, these, our department level student associations uh, and they interface both uh, with the department and with PGSS. Uh, they represent you specifically uh, and their executives are people from your program um, or, or your department depending on the size. Um, and these are probably the most impactful uh, groups for graduate students at McGill. Um, each one is different. They offer different events and different resources but they do a lot of things like social events, mentoring programs, writing groups, these sorts of things. Um, but I would, I would highly recommend that every one of you reach out to your PGSA and get to know them. Um, these students tend to be really active and engaged. Um, they achieve a lot, they try a lot, they really work for their community. Being surrounded by people like that is never a bad thing. Um, I was highly involved with my own PGSA during my graduate studies. And uh, yeah, I think a number of them are the people I still talk to the most um, on a day to day or week to week basis. Um, we're, still, we're still good friends uh, and they can really help you out um, uh, throughout your degree. So I do suggest you connect with them. Uh, and then if you're looking to connect with a specific community, there is a lot here at McGill. Uh, first up, we have First People's House. Uh, this is another student services at McGill um, dedicated to supporting uh, Indigenous students, um, including, uh, not limited to Indigenous students um, from Canada, uh, but um, Indigenous students anywhere, such as uh, Maori students and so forth. They can all come to First People's House for support. We have First Up. This is the first generation student support uh, program group at uh, McGill University. Uh, if you're not aware of what first generation means, uh, these are students whose uh, immediate family, who are the first in their immediate family or um, basically whose parents or whose guardians did not go to post-secondary education. As such, um, they don't have quite as much support as someone who comes from a, a family who's been through a few generations of university, for instance. So this is a peer support group. Um, who uh, that is dedicated just to, to helping each other out um, and navigating McGill. They offer uh, 
uh, they run specific events uh, and offer resources specifically for first generation students. Uh, you can join for free. There's no cost to it. You just have to be first gen. Uh, Annie um, perhaps can talk a little more about it if she likes, because she's much more familiar with it than I am. Yeah, so we are at Claire happy to work with first up the, the student group, as, as Chris mentioned. So this is a group that um, throughout the year, they plan some events, some meetups. Um, the idea is to really create a community amongst first generation students. Um, often, I think we, we hear from from first generation students that one of the challenges is, you know, feeling feeling like they belong in a university environment and these sort of challenges like this. So creating a community of people who feel the same way and who are facing the same challenges and can support each other is really powerful. We also have a lot of first generation faculty here at McGill who are also very involved in these these initiatives who are very uh, visible and vocal about their the fact that they're first gen. So that's always a really, um, really great source of support as well for this community and uh, great, uh, great voices to look up to as well. So thank you. Um, and then we have um... SSMU, that's the Student Society of McGill University, their club services and independent student groups, um, of which there are over 250. Uh, and this is where you can find both like interest or hobby-based clubs, but actual specific services or um, societies uh, for racialized students, societies based on specific languages, religions, cultures. There's, you know, the, the Black Student Network, the Arab Student Network, there is the Hellenic Student Society, so on and so forth. Um, uh, there are, yeah, 250 in total. There's a lot to to explore there if you want to find um, if you want to find specific communities, uh, including Queer McGill, uh, who we collaborate with on um, some orientation activities as well. Let's see. So we're almost done. Uh, this is Red Path Museum, a um, bit of a neoclassical uh, take on a temple there. Uh, it's really lovely inside. It's a, a beautiful collection. Um, I don't know if they're open right at the moment, but hopefully in the new year, if they're not yet, I do suggest you check it out when you're here. I should have grabbed a picture from the inside, but it's, it's just such an iconic building. I had to throw it up. Okay, so our final little things before the Q&A. Graduate orientation. Uh, winter 2023 orientation is just around the corner. Uh, all graduate students are encouraged to attend. It's in person. It's going to be from 5 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. on Wednesday, January 4th, which is the first day of classes. Again, um, you don't need to worry about writing this down. You will be receiving an official email invite uh, to it. Um, but you really want to check it out for the what I wish I'd known when starting graduate school, grad school, sorry, uh, student panel, uh, where you'll hear back from a group of um, four or five uh, returning graduate students about their tips and advice and their perspective on graduate studies here at McGill. Uh, there'll also be refreshments and a couple chances to mingle and network with others. Um, so other new graduate students, but also some members of staff uh, here at McGill as well. And then afterwards, uh, the Postgraduate Student Society is hosting a hot chocolate social at Thompson House. Um, there will be no cost to attend, and it is actually open to uh, both incoming students as well as returning students. So it's a good place if you want to try it. Um, if you want to get to know and mingle around with the, the wider graduate community, um, they'll be at orientation and they will walk you over to Thompson House if you're not sure where it is, which on the first day class is perfectly reasonable. Uh, it's only going to be about a block walk. though. Uh, and registration is already open on the Get Ready website. Again, you should receive an email specifically about this. But when I um, when I email out these slides to everyone, you can also click the link there. I just want to go ahead, yeah. Chris, before we move on about um, uh, Someone was asking about the safety of campus, especially near the graduate community, the McGill Ghetto. I'm curious about that. Um, it is a safe campus. Um, yeah, it, it's, it is a downtown urban area. Um, there is graffiti and such you will see. Um, I wouldn't leave your bike out at night unlocked somewhere. Um, but on the whole, the McGill Ghetto, uh, it, it's referred to a, as a ghetto, but that is not the colloquial sense of ghetto. Uh, it just denotes a small neighborhood. Um, it is mostly rather expensive uh, row houses um, that rents out primarily to uh, wealthier students at McGill, uh, if, if you're being given a bad impression by the name ghetto. Uh, but on the whole, it's, it's quite a nice area. Uh, we're at the bottom of the uh, Montreal, uh, the big, uh, 
it's referred to as a mountain. Uh, uh, coming from someone who lives outside the Rockies or grew up outside the Rockies, I call it a, a very large hill. Um, but it's it got a beautiful observatory where you can see all of downtown. Um, yeah, it's it's a nice area. It is safe. Uh, campus is just a block from the closest metro station. Um, yeah, I don't know what uh, what more I can offer. If you have specific questions, I'm happy to to try and address them. Uh, okay, so finally, where to get advice and answers. Uh, because there are a lot of avenues for getting advice. Um, I'm going to lay out some major ones here and sort of give you some direction on, on when, to, when to use them. So your graduate, your graduate program coordinator, anything program specific you have, any of the questions that are program specific, direct towards them. They are the best person to uh, answer them and part of their job is answering them. Uh, new student mentorship program and international buddy program. Uh, you want to... Um, apply for these if you want to be matched with an upper year graduate student. Uh, I would uh, apply now. Um, the only difference, the only real difference between these two programs is the new student mentorship program is for Canadian students, whereas the international buddy program is for international students. In both cases, you'll be uh, matched with a um, an existing graduate student here at McGill or a returning graduate student here at McGill who can uh, share with you, uh, their experiences, tell you about what it's like, give you give you a student perspective or student, you know, on the ground tips to to living, working, studying here in Montreal. Uh, let's see, graduate entering class Facebook group again. Uh, if you want to go connect or just find out, you know, who other grads uh, students here are at McGill. Uh, if you're ever looking for roommates, it's a great place place to post up that sort of thing. Um, and if you have questions, they can be answered by other students. You know, again, there's 1,300 of them right now, or by uh, Clay staff. Uh, there is GradHub. Uh, this is a website uh, produced by Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies, which provides general information useful to incoming graduate students. I do suggest you read through it. There is the Students Helping Students website again. It's a directory of peer support and mentorship programs. Uh, it's a good place if you are ever looking for peer support or if you ever want to offer peer support, it's a great place to find uh, ways to contribute to the community. Uh, and finally, campus life and engagement. Um, there was a slide at the beginning which had our email and, and I believe the Get Ready website. Uh, if you pop here to campus life engagement, that link, you'll also receive our address and our phone number. We don't have an automated phone system. If you call us during our operating hours, a human being will answer your call and, and do their best to, to answer whatever question you have. Um, and we like to say that we either know the answer or we know who does. So we do, we do hope to hear from you if you ever need that support. And finally, thank you. Uh, we're going to switch over to the Q&A, and Annie, if you could stop the recording at this point.